nice to see so many here. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Nathaniel. That's on the slide as well over here. And today I would like to talk about this specific topic, dealing with thresholds concepts and then uh, mistake-driven learning. Has anyone heard about mistake-driven learning before? You have a little bit. Okay, so that is a concept that is kind of known to some people. Um, but what I would like to do is I would like to connect that with uh, dealing with thresholds. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with that term, dealing with thresholds. Maybe you are, maybe you're not, but I hope that after uh, this presentation, this short presentation, you have a better idea of what it means uh, and also uh, the way I think, uh, and it's more of a hypothesis that I have. Uh, and I would like to just challenge you, but you so also you can challenge me on this. Uh, so it's an open debate, basically. So let's move on to the next slide. Uh, next, okay, yeah. <laughs> so this is the agenda for today. Uh, I will do a short introduction of uh, what it is and also, uh, yeah, what it is not. Then I will come up with the problems that I have noticed in my classes. Uh, and then I also have an hypothesis. And okay, what are the objectives in that case that I want to achieve? Um, I also have a personal action plan that I try to include in my, uh, well, some of my courses to deal with that. Uh, and then I also will explain a few cases on, okay, what are the things that I uh, have noticed and also how do I address it and how do I work with the students in that respect. But there are challenges, there are problems, and I need help with that. So uh, I uh, want you to actually work on those kind of things and discuss it. Uh, can we deal with those challenges in some way? And in that case also how? Uh, but maybe also like, oh, this is really, really difficult, so maybe there is no solution for it. That's fine as well. But uh, I think we just need to keep this in mind and be creative and maybe come up with something that can solve this. Um, so the challenges I will present and then, uh, yeah, you will have different topics and then the plan is that we have an, an open space, which means basically that we have four or five different challenges that we're having. And if you feel like I want to contribute to something to this challenge, then you just go to that table and you discuss maybe on people with on the same table. But if you feel like, okay, now I'm, I'm done with this challenge, I have maybe something else that I want to talk about, then you can move just to another table. So it's also a little bit more dynamic, and you're not just sitting at your own table. Sounds all right, then um, let's go. Yes, threshold concepts. Uh, just to explain a little bit what I mean with threshold concepts, is like a, a block in students' understanding which is necessary to overcome in progress. Uh, so it's often early in the st uh, studies that they have a block in their understanding and it's like, okay, we try to explain it and then we think they know, but they actually don't know. Uh, I will come to back to that later a little bit. Um, I am from the University of Applied Sciences uh, and I work in engineering. So engineering is heavily based on science but you have to be able to apply it. So it's both the theoretical aspect, but also the practical aspect. And that's where I often see the challenge. Because in theory, it seems like students often know it, but then in practice, it seems like, no, not quite. Um, and I think that when it comes to this, it's often like we focus on the what and the how. So it's like, okay, how do you do it and what do you need to do? But we talk very little about the why. Uh, why is this important? So, example, we work with math and physics, and it's like, okay, you get the theory, you learn the theory, and then it's like, here you have several challenges, problems you need to solve, and then the answer is right or the answer is wrong. That's how it normally is. And then it's like, okay, you just need to train this a lot of times and then hopefully over time you have an understanding of what you're doing and how you're doing it. But the why is often not considered in that respect. So what I discovered is that many of those thresholds that 
we tried to address in the beginning, and the students train with those over and over and over again. When they come to their graduation, uh, I noticed that some of the thresholds are very stubbornly still there. And it's like, that's not good. So we have spent a lot of time and a lot of energy to train the students to, to work with this type of problems. Uh, and on theory, they can solve those, but in practice, it seems like they are still lacking uh, a lot in their understanding. Uh, some of the examples, and I am sorry because now it's going to be a little bit more specific about my topic, design engineering, uh, but I will also explain a few of those things. So I hope you can uh, <laughs> also understand this and, and bear with me in that case. Um, so some of the things that I notice is about the project description, and then they have difficulties about what is the problem definition, what are the objectives, and what also are the deliverables, and I just mix those up and it's like, okay, what are you actually going to do? And also, what are the deliverables? And it's like, that's not exactly the same as solving the problem sometimes. Um, so that was one of the things. Uh, in design engineering, it's also very much that we, uh, we work with customers, uh, customer needs. What are those customer needs? Uh, but then also, we need to translate those customer needs to technical requirements that we need to yeah, take in consideration. And then there's also something we call marginal values and ideal values. And it's more like, okay, it's, it's an absolute demand or it's a wish, something that would be nice to have or something that we absolutely need to include in our uh, project or in our solution. Another one uh, which is very interesting is, to, yeah, you have a question? Hmm? Marginal utility for marginal value. Yeah, so I don't know if I understand you're correct, uh, but marginal values is basically what we say is we need to fulfill this uh, to actually get a good solution. Uh, when if it's an ideal value, it's like, okay, this is something we want to aim for. This is the best solution. So we have acceptable solutions, that's the marginal values, and then there's the ideal solution, and this is the, okay, this is the, the ultimate value that we aim for. So that's kind of the difference between them. I can get back to that lit a little bit later in example. So maybe it becomes clear in that case. Um, then there's also something, it's the difference between functions and features of a product. And to many students, are like, what is the difference between those kind of things? And I also show an example a little bit later on what is the difference and how should you think and what is a function and what is a feature. So. Of course, there's also something about mechanical engineering, it's about stress, and then it's, uh, okay, what is tension, compression? I will not go into detail in that part, but this is also very difficult for a student to understand. And then they do a calculation, and then it's like, yeah, but in this case, you actually have a different type of stress, uh, which they don't realize. Um, but I will not go into that, because I think that's maybe a little bit outside of the scope of, of this workshop. Uh, but it's interesting to, uh, to actually also notice that. And then the last one is like, uh, the, we work with models, and there's also the reality, and students have a very difficult time to understand the difference between what is a model and what is actually reality, and yeah, the fidelity of the model, how much detail does it has, uh, there's also restrictions on what you can do with models, so we have also requirements on the models, but then they're like, yeah, but the requirements on the model, is that the same as the requirements on a product? And it's like, no, it's not. There's different things there. Uh, so students have a lot of challenges to overcome and a lot of those thresholds that they're, it's, I feel like it's difficult for them to understand those kind of things. So this is just some of the things that I noticed and I think it's a big problem. So the objective for me is, okay, how can I reduce the time to overcome these thresholds? Because if we just, apparently we give them a lot of examples and they train and train and train. It's both a lot of uh, time and energy from the student, but also from the teacher. And in the end, apparently they don't seem to understand anyways. So that just feels to me like it's, it's a waste of time for me as a teacher and also it's a waste of time for the students because they still understand. Um, and then of course the other thing is that I want to strengthen the understanding of those kind of things. So, my hypothesis, and I know this is a little bit debatable because uh, it can be sometimes seen as, yeah, this is poor teaching, but I actually would like to confront 
the students directly with their thresholds, with their misconceptions. Um, early and on, and let them deliberately make mistakes. Uh, because I hear so often with the students, like, or I, I get an impression of them, that it's like, yeah, I know this. I don't have to pay too much attention to this. Okay, yeah, I, I know this. Whereas if they realize that they don't know this, then they maybe are more open actually to learn. So I know it's, uh, it's a little bit debatable because you're confronting students and it's always, it's not nice and it's not fun to make mistakes. But I think it's also a necessary element uh, when it comes to, to learning. Uh, in my case, I learn a lot more from my mistakes than that I do uh, when I do things right from the start. So this is my hypothesis that we can overcome these thresholds faster by actually confronting them right away with those kind of uh, misconceptions. Uh, and also that it becomes more effectively. So we, we also increase the understanding of the different concepts. So here's a little bit of my action plan of what I try to do in my classes. So, like I said early on, I actually don't start to focus on the what and the how, but I start to focus on the why. Why is this important for you to know? So, and that is all I explain to them. It's like, okay, here you have the literature and I give them different articles or books or whatever, and it's like, okay, read those. What is your uh, understanding of this? How do you apply this? And then, afterwards, I let the students discuss in different groups. So they have this assignment, they come back the next time, they do it, they start to discuss in groups. And very often, they, they start to realize, oh, that person did it like this. That person did it like that. And it's a little bit also what uh, Dave mentioned yesterday. Uh, you are basically confronted with those kind of differences. And it doesn't mean that all those differences are wrong. You c it can be also different interpretations, and they can all be right as well. But being able to, to be challenged on that aspect, I think, is important. So they will discuss first. Uh, and then also I ask, OK, based on the information that you've seen from, from your teammate, are you willing to take over? Do you think that the information that you receive is good enough, actually, to continue working with? Uh, if it's your own work, it's often very easy, because like I understand, uh, or I have my own understanding of what I wrote down, but if someone else is listening to it and maybe also reading it, it's like, yeah, I'm not quite sure if I can actually handle this, or I actually know what to do. And then, of course, you get also those kind of discussions. Okay, but what do you mean with this? What do you mean with that? So. And then I start to discuss in the class the main learning difficulties uh, and also highlight the misconceptions. So what is this, the things that we, yeah, they, they notice like, okay, I, this is a challenge for us. Uh, and then, of course, I also give a mini lecture often like you do uh, on the specific topics. Uh, and then I also asked at the end, I basically asked them, okay, so now we have discussed this together, would you like to update your material? So it's not like this is an examining moment, but this is a learning moment. And I have to say that when I ask these questions and I ask them to raise their hands if they want to update it, all of them do. So I think that they actually do realize, okay, I need to study more, I have a better understanding right now, and I want to update the material. All right, so that is basically what I do. And then uh, I think I will ask uh, or go through a few cases that I have. And this is, this is very common things. Uh, it's engineering focused, um, because I'm working with engineering. Um, and then one of the things that students have a lot of problems with is like, okay, we have the customer needs. Uh, they'd have to go out, they have to do interviews. Okay, what are the needs of the, the customer? And then they have to convert that to technical requirements. And why do we need to convert it to technical requirements? Because we want to measure things. Um, so this is a typical case that I can find. So the customer need is basically, I want it to be easy to carry, whatever it is. 
So then the technical requirement, you can break it down. It's like, okay, easy to carry, maybe that's a low weight. That's, that's interesting. And also maybe something about ergonomic grip, um, which means that it's nice to actually hold in your hand. Um, and then the other thing is also, of course, sustainability. It's like, okay, environment friendly materials. And then you can have uh, the units. In this case, you have kilograms, yes or no. And the other one is yes or no. And then the marginal demand, and then the ideal value, yes or no. The thing is, when I see those kind of things, there is a lot of things you can question. There's a lot of mistakes in this. So what I would like you to do is just a few minutes. Uh, do you think that these kind of requirements are good requirements? And also, how could you maybe uh, formulate them in a better way? So just maybe two, three minutes, discuss with each other. Do you think that this is good? And I think it's not good. But in this case, how can you formulate those things maybe a little bit better? There are a few mistakes in it as well. Yeah, it's the, it's the, white, the white part that I'm like, okay, can you maybe reformulate parts of the technical requirements? Maybe you can also redefine the units and also the, the demand, the marginal value, and the ideal value. Can those be also updated in a better way? So a couple of minutes, keep the customer needs, but also the technical requirements. The customer, customer needs are the same, and the technical requirements uh, leave them the same as well. So it's only the units and uh, the demand and the wishes. Okay, how can you define those maybe better? Thank you. Yeah, so uh, you already have a lot of discussions about it. I think it's, that's really, really great because that's, the, of course, also how it should be. Um, I can point out a few things, and I'm an engineer, so I'm just going to uh, state exactly what it says. So if I have something like easy to carry, low weight, and I have as a demand, I have four kilograms. So, okay, it's like the idea, the, the, the marginal value is four kilograms. I have to that, do that. So, if the wish is three kilograms, how can that actually be? Yeah, it, they don't match in this case because four kilograms. If I have to up, uh, fulfill that, then three kilograms automatically is not okay anymore. You understand that kind of thing? Uh, then the other thing, the the last one, uh, sustainability, and then it's like yes and no, and this is a very common mistake I see students make. So if I literally read what it says over here, it says sustainability is environmental friendly materials. No, it should not have environment friendly materials. That's basically what it says. But what they mean is like, okay, it's not a demand, it's a wish. So in that case, you just remove the no overall from the demands and just have it as a wish, as a yes. But this is one of those typical things that students do f wrong. Because it's like if you really state it as this, as an engineer, I read it like, okay, environmental friendly materials, no. It doesn't have to have that. So how can you improve this? And um, here I have a few more things. So the first mistake about the demands, about the kilograms, is like, okay, it has to be less than four kilograms. And then the less than three kilograms is still included in that part. The other thing is about ergonomic grip. I hate that because you can measure that. You can, okay, you can do, you can do tests. You can just ask people and it's like, okay, do you think this is ergonomic? But we as engineers, we often like to have things that we can measure. Uh, I actually missed the picture over here, but here we have a picture of uh, the grip of hands and also the, the diameters. So here we basically can actually kind of see what is the ideal parts of a hand. And of course there's a lot of different hands, but then you can say, okay, the, I think that the diameter should be somewhere between 25 and 40 millimeters. That should be acceptable, but ideally I think it should be 35. And this is all 
fact-based. You can find those kind of data in, in tables and whatever. Uh, and then the other thing about environmental friendly materials is like you can never get 100% sustainability. So then I'm like, okay, just put a percentage, percentage on it. How much of the material do, do you want to be sustainable or recyclable or whatever? This is not perfect by far, but this is giving you a much better understanding of those kind of things. And it's much clearer on what you need to fulfill. Um, and those are also measurable. So as an engineer, I like those kind of things. I can just make a solution. It's like, does it fulfill it? Yes, it does. Great. I can move on. So this is one of the examples. Uh, the other example I can show you over here is uh, the typical thing about a function analysis. And this is one of the, the very hard things for students also to understand. So here I have a function analysis or a function tree. And what we basically do is that we look at the product and it's like, what is the main function of this product? What is the main function of a chair? The main function of a chair, discuss, discuss two minutes with each other. What is the main function of a chair? Any suggestions? What is the main function of a chair? To sit. Yeah, that's, that's also what the students say, it's to sit. Yeah. Yeah. To protect you from standing. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. Another suggestion? Yeah. Uh, to carry a human being's weight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. Another one? Uh, prestige. Prestige, yeah. So, it's interesting because already now it's like, okay, what, are the, 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 what is the main function? And the main function of a chair is actually to carry weight. So you were right. Uh, that's the main function, to support, to uh, carry weight. Because if you're saying sitting, that is what you do on a chair. But it's not what the product does. Okay, like what? Okay. Um, well, nowadays it has to, for example, what you said, look good. Mm. Uh, needs to be almost a design element. Yes. Which does, which means it's may very often not even comfortable to sit and mm. done, doesn't maybe even carry the weight, but yeah. it's just beautiful. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, exactly, but we are, we are buying stuff with the eyes. And then it needs to be ergonomic friendly, So, because all of us has lower back problems, so it needs to mm -hmm. protect this ones. Mm -hmm. Then um, it needs to be comfortable, like cushions. Yeah. Or so uh, I completely agree with that. <laughs> However, you were right that those are features. Those are not functions. I, I, I see where you're coming from the marketing perspective. Um, but he's coming from the engineering perspective, so what is it good for? So the, the, all the other, it's like the phone, I was just wondering what's the, what's the feature, what's the function, and I think there we're getting lost a little bit because it Yeah, changed. because it's a multifunction, it's a multifunctional device. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a multifunctional device, uh, so it does a lot of things. Um, and of course, ergonomics and looks, they are extremely important. But they are features, and I just say to them, to the students, yes, uh, those are also important, but those are features. Yes, but if you're doing a function analysis, you want to focus on the function of the product. Uh, and that is exactly the problem that students have, because they think about, uh, they have done customer needs, and they think from the human perspective, which is great, but now they suddenly have to think from a product perspective. And say, okay, but what is the product, what does the product need to do? Uh, and the th only thing that the product has to do is carry weight. Uh, so here I have one for uh, a vacuum cleaner charger, uh, and a student actually made this one. And then, of course, this was the, the theoretical part behind it that we also talked about. Um, and then I started to ask them, I said, okay, but what parts of this one over here is actually something that the product doesn't do, but the human does? 
yeah, what is it that the human does in this case? It's like, okay, put the charger's cable in an outlet. Is that something that the product can do by itself? No, that's something that the human does. Um, put the vacuum cleaner on the charger. Is that something that the product can do by itself? No, it cannot. The human does it. So, by only asking this question, okay, but how in that case does it work? They, they start to think about it and say, like, okay, you're right, I need to update it. So, afterwards, they made another one. And it's like, okay, I think that students often, they want to put in many, many features in the function tree. And it's like, but the, the function tree can be really, really short, depending on the, the uh, technological advancements of the product. So, you have the chair, the main thing is to carry things. You have a table, the main thing is to actually support weight. Uh, it's the same as the chair. If you have a bag, same function, it's also to support weight, basically, in a certain extent. So, you have a lot of products that actually have very similar functionality. Um, but the students find it really hard to differentiate between the functions and the features. So, again, I need to actually challenge them on this and it's like, okay, hats on, do a function analysis and then we start to discuss, okay, what are the main, uh, main challenges in this one? Uh, last example I have uh, is about um, creating a physical functional model and then ask for a model building plan. And here, this is this project course I do, um, and then the students, uh, they have done the customer needs and they came up with solutions. And then you see a sketch like that in the corner, uh, on the, the right-hand corner and the top. And it's like, yeah, this is kind of what we want to do. And instead of just saying, well, there's a lot of question marks, I'm like, okay, build it. And then when I get to the, the work floor, then they, start, then they start the engineering discussions. Because then it's like, okay, how do we actually connect those kind of things? What kind of material are we going to use? Uh, so I, I can talk about it because I do uh, actually a lecture on, on how to think as a, how to work with model building. You have a question? Um, the, um, does a student come up with a version of, of Billy or do you give them the Billy? Um, I'm just trying to get my head around what is, is the student making them? Is, is this something the student makes and then another student looks at it and then gives? Well, yeah, in this case, I actually give the example of the, uh, what I expect from a model building planning. I think it, yeah, it should be a little bit like an IKEA instructions. Like this is the, 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 the part list and this is the way you should assemble it. It can be very, very rough. Uh, but also in this case, students don't understand that because they have never actually built something. So I ask for a model builder plane. They, they kind of do it, but they don't really understand, even though I say it's important and why it's important. But then when they get to the, the workshop and they start building their models, then suddenly they're like, aha, now I understand why it's important. Uh, and it's the same because I have, the, and that's also why I thought basically the hypothesis that I came up with is like in many cases we teach things but they don't understand until they actually do it. Uh, so I have a, they, it's a course on, on uh, also on group dynamics. We talked about it just a little bit. Uh, and I have a whole, I have someone from social, social psychology who does a lecture at the beginning of the course on group dynamics. And also well, the importance of group contract. They do it, but it's always afterwards. And I had a, a, an evaluation for the last year's course and it was like, we need more information on uh, group dynamics and we need more information on model building. And I'm like, we actually gave you this at the beginning of the course, but you were not ready to understand this because you have to go through the process yourself first before you actually understand it. So I thought it was basically more of a confirmation that this is on the right track anyways. They have to go through it. They have to make their mistakes and then they learn from it. And then they realize, okay, this is what I, need to work on later on. So these were some of the cases, um, but there are also a lot of challenges. There are teacher related challenges. Uh, we are having this very traditional way of, uh, of working. So it's, um, I stand in front of the class, I do my lecture, students are over there and they're listening, they're like, okay, 
yeah, that's boring. Um, but also, we teachers, we, we want to be, in, I feel like we often want to be in control. We know our material and we don't want to let go of it. Uh, and in my case, I need to be quite adaptive and agile in the way I teach. Uh, because I never know. I've had group dynamics which didn't work and I had to spend so many hours to just get them to the finish, which was not a lot of fun. Uh, but I handled it. Um, also, of course, there's a lot of things student-related. They get frustrated. It's confusing. It's like, okay, pff, why are we here? What are we doing over here? I don't understand. Uh, little guidance. But on the other side, uh, if they get out in the real life, uh, they don't have a boss to, and they can't go to their boss like, okay, is this right? The boss was just like, I have a problem, solve it. So they have to figure out themselves, how do they get the information? But also I want them to be very critical in their own understanding. Do I understand correctly? Maybe I need to learn and read more about this. Because, yeah, I'm always questioning myself. Do I really understand this? Uh, and I have a very hard time uh, to actually confirm that. It's like, yeah, I'm not quite sure. So I think that is uh, the attitude that you need to have. Because also, uh, if you are not 100% certain, you also need to ask other people maybe for help. Um, the other thing, of course, making mistake is perceived as failure. And I want to get away from that. I think mistakes, making mistakes is extremely important for learning. But for a student, it feels like failure. Uh, and also, of course, uh, there's a lot of different types of students. If they don't feel like, they have the slightest feeling like I can fail, they might put in a lot of extra effort, or they might not put in any effort at all. And they just want to wait for the right answer that the teacher in that, in that case explains. Um, and of course, the last part is like, the students are very much about, I want to have my grade, I want to pass this course. Whereas I much more am focusing on the, the process of learning. Um, so that's another challenge that, uh, that we're facing. So I need to have help. Uh, there's papers on your tables. And um, I th we have four groups, I skip uh, the second one. Um, so the first topic I would want to talk about, how do we create a safe environment for the students, which is really important. Uh, when it comes to mistake-driven learning, or, yeah, mistake learning. Uh, and how can we provide appropriate support? But it's not only about the safe environment for the students, it's also the safe environment for the teacher, because they have to come out of their comfort zone as well. Uh, the second one, I can just briefly mention it, but I think we skipped that for now, is the social collective. How do we encourage learning together? Because it's often in those group dynamics also that uh, David uh, talked about yesterday that they learn a lot about the discussions between them. So I think that's kind of covered in, in your part. Um, the other thing I didn't actually mention, but when it comes to engineering and innovation, uh, innovation is often 10,000 times of failing before you actually hit the right solution. So we need to encourage bravery, uh, but also a bravery for the teacher again to get out of their comfort zone, but also for the students how to get out of their comfort zone and actually try different things, innovate, maybe fail, but also learn from it. Uh, then the fourth is about ambitions and preferences. Uh, we have a lot of students, uh, like I said earlier, some they have very low ambitions and some have very high ambitions. And then you also have the students that are like, yeah, I just, if I don't get into good instructions, I will not do anything until the teacher actually tells me exactly what I need to do. Uh, and then you have the high performance, of like, okay, they just put way too much effort in there because they, they are afraid to fail. And they just spend more energy than I actually would want them to. Uh, but also, I think, for our, from our teacher perspective, again, we also have our preferences and ambitions as teachers. Uh, and the final one is, okay, about the assessments. Uh, we often focus on the, the results, both we and the students. What are, yeah, what do we want them to learn at the end of the course? But how do we move to a more process-oriented uh, way of assessment? So I would, uh, it's an open space in this case, so you can go to the different tables, but let's just say that over here on this table, we're going to discuss problem number one. So that's about the safe environment. On that table, table number two, uh, we're going to talk about encourage bravery. So how can we work with that? And then 
over there on the table, we take the fourth problems, the ambitions and preferences, and then you on the final table about the assessment. Um, again, it's an open space, so you can move from table to table. You can contribute whenever you are, wherever you want. Uh, but also, of course, I would like you to have discussions with your colleagues about it. Okay, how can we basically work with this kind of thing? Do we see challenges? Uh, and also, if you have things about, I don't believe in this concept, please raise your hand and talk to me about it because it's just an hypothesis and this is my feeling and insight that I have, but I could be wrong about it. So um, please also, I'm open also for discussions internally. Sounds like uh, the rest of the time we can work with this. Good. So um, go ahead. Oh, you have a question? No, no, in Yeah. So you, yeah, you could both do both. You could, uh, but I think you, you need to consider both the teacher and the student. Yeah, in all of the types of problems. Thank you very much. I think uh, we had a lot of great discussions uh, and it was great to see that uh, you are so enthusiastic about this. Um, I don't know if there's any, some people like maybe to have some, some reflections on this exercise. Uh, we uh, soon will have coffee, I understand, but maybe just some quick reflections on, on the exercise, but also about this kind of methodology that I proposed about uh, actually encouraging to make mistakes in, uh, in the process. Anyone who would like to maybe say a few words on this? I really like it because I see in my students often they're afraid to try if they're not sure that it's, um, it's going to be perfect. Um, some students won't start writing even uh, if it's not an applied task. Um, so I think it's a wonderful idea to, 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 to create a culture of acceptance of trying and praising and acknowledge effort, not only correctness. I, I, um, and creativity. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> uh, more care. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, uh, we were discussing that the famous picture that is uh, usually in social media about our education system. So that uh, if you evaluate and measure in one only one way, if the students or the people are different or they think different. So uh, in this picture, uh, you might have seen it, that there's a, there's a guy that we have an exam and it will be measured in the same way. Uh, for the fair selection, everybody has to take the same uh, exam, please climb a tree. But the students are fish, a monkey, bird. So how come a, a fish climb a tree if the evaluation is the same? It will be, feel stupid. So making mistake, might be the biases of, our, of us, how we measure and evaluate success in our uh, respective models and courses. Thank you very much. This reminds me actually also of a study uh, that uh, with uh, children, and it was like uh, how many would be geniuses uh, they tested. And it would be like uh, almost 100% geniuses uh, when they were kids. Then they tested again a couple of years later after uh, several years of uh, education. And uh, the amount of creativity and geniuses went down quite drastically because, of course, they were molded in this specific thing. Um, you have to think like this and you have to do it like that. So, yeah, there's something wrong there. All right. Uh, I look forward to what you wrote down and I will check it out uh, and see, see that. Uh, I hope uh, it was an interesting and uh, exciting exercise. And I think it's time for coffee. And, of course, if you want to discuss more, we can do it under the time of coffee, right?
Yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah.